you know, be a band. You're not, you know, when you when you when you come into the studio, you know, I don't want you to put your recording hat on, your single hat on, your album hat on. I want you to put your band hat on. The same one you were out there playing at the Newcastle Workers Club or wherever you were playing. Welcome to Audio Technology Magazine's ISO Booth Podcast, where we phone audio engineers and producers at home. And thanks to the pandemic lockdown, they answer. Hey everybody, welcome to another Audio Technology Magazine ISO Booth Podcast. Today, it gives me great pleasure to welcome legendary Australian music producer Mark Opitz to the ISO booth. Welcome, Mark. Hi. Nice to be here in the ISO booth. So far away. <laughs> um, you notice that I did my very best to avoid the term legendary Oz Rock producer, but uh, I hope you took notice of that. Yeah, I, I don't consider myself a producer. I consider myself a music person. Mm. Yep. You know, I, but for the simple reason, I really don't know what producers do. Mm. Mm. You know, I've only ever worked with two, so it's. Um, what was the first? Uh, well, the only producers I ever worked with were Vander and Young. Right. Okay. Cool. And and they sort of, um, you know, took me on as their apprentice back in the uh, gee, late seventies, mm. and it was a quite interesting. Um, Introduction because they they they'd heard that I'd been sacked from EMI through no fault of my own, but through I don't know it was um, someone else had made an error and I got blamed for it. But certainly I was a totally innocent. I swear about that. And uh, but Van and Young heard about it and they asked um, they asked me in the interview to uh, a mutual friend Wayne DeGrucci, uh, who used to manage John Paul Young, the late Wayne DeGrucci, and um, he, he asked me to, um, uh, Dan you know, asked me to come in for a talk. So I spoke to him for a couple of hours, and after a couple of hours, they said, George said to me in his Scottish accent, Look, uh, situation is that uh, we need an apprentice or somebody to help us out. Uh, are you interested in the job? So don't, ask, don't, don't answer straight away, but uh, bring me back in a couple of days and see if you're interested. So you can imagine I went home and sat by the phone for 48 hours. <laughs> right on the right on the dot, you know, and uh, picked up and said, "Yeah, I'm in." And, um, and so I turned up at you know whatever it was, nine o'clock at Alberts on a Monday morning. And George and Harry said to me, "Oh, we just recorded a track last week, rock track, you know. It's, it's sitting on the machine down in Studio One, which is Studio One just explains Vander and Young's private studio, which come on." Uh, Van Der Young and my private studio for three years. Mm. And we worked on all our projects together and my solo projects. But getting back to it, the first day was I walked down, you know, they took me down there and said, yeah, okay, here's tapes on the machine. It's all marked up. It, 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 you know, it, uh, sort of, you know, it was a Neve console. And so I started working away on this song called Bad Boy for Love by Rose Tattoo. That was my first day. Yeah, wow. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> baptism and of fire. So, yeah, and so that was a baptism of fire. Not that I knew it was a baptism of fire because it wasn't released at that time. Mm. And uh, re- I mean, I'd seen the tats at the Bondi Lifesaver and places like that. But, mm. Um, mm. but that was my first job, basically. And continued on from there. And, and with those guys, I was lucky enough to work on, you know, like, Everything they were working on, because I was basically their apprentice, you know, and they really wanted me to do all their engineering for them and stuff like that, because they weren't happy with the sounds that they were pulling. Hmm. So I, I, I think, I think from memory, the first album track I did with them was uh, "Let There Be Rock" for ACDC, hmm. and that sort of changed things around. And then I did an album called "Power Age" for ACDC as well. Hmm. Where I spent a lot of time going through 16 Marshall quad boxes and eight amplifiers, testing each amplifier against not just each quad box, but each speaker. Oh, my gosh. And that took two, three weeks. Wow. And I sat there with an SG just hitting an A chord open, you know, finding a sweet spot on each of them, marking a book until I had pages of it, till I fit. Then I, by the time we went into the studio with Angus, and uh, and Malcolm, I um, I said Angus, this is your amp, and Malcolm, this is your amp. 
and and that's the way it went. And we did this great album called Power Age. Which, yeah, wow. It's just it's it's still a classic, you know. I mean, uh, to the aficionado ACDC fan, I think Power Age rates up there pretty much as the best. It's not Black and Black, which is probably the most popular. So, what did you learn about music? You know, about music production, like the role of the producer from from Van and yeah. Young. I learned a lot. You know, like obviously the, the usual things, like arrangement, um, you know, hooks. But always remember George saying, "You got to be able to dance to it." And by dance, dance to it, it means tap your foot to it. You've got to be able to tap your foot. And, you know, and also I learned two crucial words which have stayed with me forever, which is feel and melody, or groove and melody, uh, things like that, you know. And so, which, which is great because it means you can take some songs that aren't so great and, and play with them till you get a good groove and, and, and get the melody a bit better and then at, at some point work on the lyrics and, and, and take it from there. But you know, one of the biggest things that I learned was that you know, if you're working with a band, it's a band. You don't go in there and put the drums down. You don't go down there and put the bass down later. You record the band as a band. You know, and, and that's pretty much you know, the way we did everything. Sure, the vocals would be going on like the basic DC, you know, Bomb, Scott, you know, we wouldn't have all the lyrics ready at the time or whatever. But the band would, would, would just cut track, cut track, cut the track, cut the track mm. until it was right. Then maybe I would have a solo. I have great memories of, mm. you know, recording a song called Riff Raff, which is my favourite ACDC song. And um, regardless, I recorded it. And Angus doing the solo in the control room and running around the control room. It was just me and Angus. And he's kicking the back of my chair and he's doing everything, you know, just in, by the fact that he's running around, not kicking me to hurt me or anything. Just, sure, just, just government. Doing it. Yeah, you know, but it was, a, it was a fantastic time, you know. But mm. there were other projects that I learned from them, like, for example, the, the uh, mother in, uh, necessity is a mother of invention. And the, um, I remember George coming in one morning and saying, oh, we've got a hit with uh, John Paul Young. In Germany, and the, the song is called "Standing in the Rain," so we need to follow that up. And standing in the rain, and, and so and so, George said, "Mark, get the hi hat loop out for um, um, standing in the rain." So I put a hi hat loop on the machine, you know, tape machine, and, so. and George had this little cord organ, little must have been two octaves, and they had little buttons on the side where you press chords, you know. Yeah, sure. And and um and so he's playing around with this little ascending melody. And he yells out to Harry, Harry, get the songbook out, get the notebook out and give me some titles, give me some lines, give me anything. Mm. So and so he, we got ch -ch 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 happening and George is playing around with this little ascending melody. Mm. And um Harry's yelling out, you know, um La Dolce Vita. No, no, no. Um, uh, I lost my love in, in London. No, no. Love is in the air. Yeah, love is in the air. That's what I went to. Let's start with that. And, uh, and so, you know, so we'll, we'll temporary working title, Love's in the Air. Mm -hmm. And so we built it. And so George kept playing this da, 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 da. And that's how it all started. Wow. And, and between the three of us, mm. we had the song done by eight o'clock at night. You know, a piece of music. Yeah, wow. And I can remember about uh, uh, eight. George has got the phone up against his ear like this, you know, and, uh, and Harry's got a, a pad, and George has got a pad, and they're ringing John Paul Young. John, can you come in? We think we've got a song for you. We're still writing the lyrics, so uh, you know, John turns up at nine o'clock. And it's, been, it's, been, it's called Love's in the Air, you know. And, and, and John had a look at it and went and tried a couple of takes and suggested a couple of little changes here and there. Just and bang. Yeah, you know, well, by midnight that done, it was done. It, right. it was recorded. So within one day, it was, as it were. We did in one day. Yeah. And then, um, but, <laughs> there's a caveat to this, it took us three weeks to mix. Ah. <laughs> Because we put so much stuff on it, you know, we had clavinets and, you know, this and that and 
you know, um, guitar, whatever. Mm. And uh, and of course, when you're mixing in those days without automation, mm. you know, it, it just you're doing separate mixes all the time. Mm. And of course, when you're microscopic on it, you, 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 you're making these little tiny changes, which to you are huge. Mm. Mm. You know, when you're making them. Mm. And so after three weeks, George just said, or whatever, two or three weeks, George just said, Mark. Mm. Get all the cassettes of the mixes, put them in a box, take them up to Ted Albert, the legend is Ted Albert, and Ted Albert is a legend. There's two legends in this business in Australia. One is Ted Albert, the other is Mike Kuczynski. Um, take it up, and if it wasn't for Ted, none of it would be here. Mm. But, but, um, and so I took the box up to Ted, you know, there's like tapes for days. And I swear, 20 minutes later, Walking in his suit, tie, and looking really neat, and that sort of thing. Holding up a cassette, said, This is one. Now, I know it would have taken him at least a week to listen to everyone. <laughs> you know? So clearly, you know, all lottery. those. So he's just picked one out. Yep, yep, sounds good. He doesn't hear all the little hi hat changes we're making, drum changes we're making. He just listened to the song. Yep. Bless his cotton socks. Yep. And he was right. There was a big lesson in that, mm. really big lesson in that. Mm. And um, and that's and that's he mm. said, yeah, that's it. And so we went and got it mastered, and the rest is history. That's amazing. It just took off from there. Which is a good in, sort of segue to uh, your uh, position on, I guess, you know, classical production techniques versus studio techniques, um, and I guess attention there about um you know perfection versus feel um, mm. like how have you has your view changed over the years or has it when it comes to studio has, has it really changed over the years you know I, um it's feel but the, the 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 thing that has changed obviously and everyone says oh analog or digital or etc etc you know, well, number one, it's the song that counts, not whether it's analog or digital. You give the staff, really. And, uh, and number two is that analog has its place and digital has its place. You know, there's things that we can do with digital stuff that you could never imagine doing with uh, analog equipment. For instance, you know, notching out, you know, a, a certain frequency of 20 dB and it's only covering, say, 5 hertz. Sure. You can never do that in analog. You know, you can get rid of sounds, you can get rid of rogue sounds, you can get phase absolutely correct. Stuff you can do with digital. Sure, you can record it on analog, you know, and you're using an analog console. You know, the way my setup is, that we, we, you know, when I'm working these days, is primarily, although I do use tape sometimes, is we're recording to the latest version of Pro Tools. But I had a custom knee desk built. Uh, along the lines of um, what we used to use for the Angels and ACDC, etc., and, st and stuff like that. Mm. But I had it built to today's spec, you know, all gold tip. I made my own Neve at the time, so he gave it to me half price. Mm. And, you know, it's just brilliant console, mm. and, which it's in a friend of mine's studio in Melbourne at the moment. Okay. And uh, so, you know, it, it's so the digital analog thing is. Mm. is, is you know, so it's great that uh, we can record it analog through the uh, need mic pre's and et cetera, et cetera, and then go to, uh, to you know, um, high res pro tools, then bring it back on the on onto the board after we've you know done our mix, opened up the mix prep, and mix prep is huge in in uh, pro tools because the digital allows you to get into those things that I was talking about by mm. phase adjustment. You know, Slight timing adjustments, uh, you know, the, you know, rogue EQ, getting rid of rogue sounds out of individual sounds and things like that. Mm. And take a very industrial approach to each individual track, mm. not to each instrument, but each track of each instrument. And uh, and then get that all worked out, then bring it back, back up on the knee and it comes up fairly clean. But as far as technique is concerned, you know, I, I've... These days and for the last few years, I've, I've adopted what I call the Frank Sinatra approach to the How does that work? And, uh, well, the Frank, if you've ever seen a picture of Frank Sinatra in the studio, you'll notice 
a few things. One, he's got a pork pie hat tilted on his head. Two, he has a valve U47 sitting in front of him like that. Mm -hmm. And four, behind him is Nelson Middle's orchestra. Okay? Mm -hmm. By the Frank Sinatra approach, I mean he records every vocal take with the orchestra. He does the orchestra doesn't do the take, and then he comes in and does it. Did, oh, he's dead now, mm. and didn't come in and do the vocal. He did the vocal at the mm. same time. Mm. And recently, I've been trying that a lot, okay. and um, and and get capturing, you know, like everything in one hit, you know, like the the, the vocal, uh, you know, solos, etc. Obviously, the band, and uh, and then you know, getting the best feel of the whole thing and then because we are working it allows me to go back and arrange post as I do as in the analogue days you'd have to do all the arranging pre you do a bit of everything but now I can now that the, you know so I can record a song for seven minutes it's got a great feel great vocal or whatever and then re-edit it down into the, the arrangement works and you know i've used that a lot mm. you know I always I always cut tracks with vocals definitely mm. and sometimes you have to redo a vocal here and there and there are times when we're doing you know looking for the, the right feel i mm. still have a guide vocal but while i'm doing the overdub i'll get the vocalist uh, say a, a guitar overdub straight after a bit hey benny from bad dreams go in and give me one more vocal mm. and he comes back then then I'll work on something else fix a bass fix another thing mm. hey Benny go and give me another vocal mm. rather than compressing all the vocals into one day you know yep. just doing and say in the end you have five vocals and you can you know comp a vocal from that and put it on including the guy vocal mm. as well so I'm very big on feel and melody mm. and that's the thing with music where it hasn't really changed you know Sure, it has done, in, in, if you're writing on a, a sequencing drum machine or a, a loop or something like that, you, you've got restrictions you've got to stick to. But um, in, in recording, you know, real music, you, you tend to do it that way. Mm. Uh, another great, for instance, for that, was I recently did a, a, a TV, or last year, a series for ABC TV called The Recording Studio. Yeah, sure. Man, I used to had the Sydney Symphony Orchestra. Did the vocal live, did three takes, bang, that's it. That's a take for years. Yeah, wow. Well. No one knows the difference. No one can tell that, you know, it's not as if I've spent days overdubbing and getting that right and this right and that right. It's just a few rehearsals, away we go. Mm. The feel, get the melody, get the atmosphere, bang. And and by the time you're finished, particularly in that show, there's not a dry eye left in the house. Yeah, it's all that feel. So it's words. Mm. And that's what music is. It's emotion. Mm. Music is our first language. From when the African or whoever native tribes were beating out a drum beat, mm. an aggressive drum beat meaning stay away, or a happy drum beat meaning, you know, people heard it, they could go towards. So it's, it's a communication and it's still a communication. It's still, a, it's still a, you know, the old cliche, the international language. It still is that. So I, 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 I subscribe to the theory very much and is that uh, the advice you would give um, any band that you work with is um, bands in particular yeah, yeah. you know when, when you know be a band mm. you're not you know when you when you when you come into the studio you know I don't want you to put your recording hat on your single hat on your album hat on I want you to put your band hat on the same one you are out there playing at the Newcastle Workers Club or wherever you're playing you know um, that's what I want you know, you need to come in and just be a band. And so pretty much we record, you know, as soon as you say, say, whoever it is, a bad friend, whatever, that's whatever, coming in, um, right, to the biggest bands, you know, in excesses or whatever, it's, you're recording straight away. You're recording every demo, everything, and little bits and pieces, and so it's like Big Brother with the cameras. You know, Big Brother, if you noticed that it took a while for people to get used to the camera thing, and then all of a sudden they got used to the camera and didn't notice them. Mm. Same thing. Mm. We're recording all the time. They don't notice. So they just play and play and play and play. And forget about the recording and just think about the playing. Mm. Mm. Could I um, take you through a few um, 
thoughts um, after having a look at another look at your uh, book recently, which um, yeah is a crackingly good read. Um, oh, thanks, Sophisto Punk. Um, the funny thing about that book is, is that uh, you know it, it, I did it with uh, uh, Jeff Jenkins and Luke Wallace. Mm. And uh, they spent years coming around to my place after Random House had sort of commissioned it, and um, and it took me a while just to, to agree to do it. But I thought, you know, a literal legacy for my family is probably a good idea, mm. and and particularly with people like Chris and Luke involved. Mm. But I can still remember I'd been in Paris or working in in um, Loire Valley on uh, a French Parisian band. Uh, and they'd send me transcripts of the trade. And I'd remember stories that I hadn't told them, so I'd be up at 7 o'clock typing away on my computer, rewriting stories and doing all that. <laughs> but I will say it's uh, I'm very happy with, with the book. It's mm. uh, Obviously, it only covers up to 2011 and things sure. like that. But it's, uh, uh, you know, I, I remember it's, it's going around to a friend's house and it was just lying on the coffee table and I had a read and it's similar to the way I listen to music I can't listen to music that I've worked on I can't put a record out and play it or a CD or a stream or something but if I hear it in a car it's quite different I hear it at the front and so it's the same with the book and I started reading the book and it's quite interesting that's a good sign that's a good yeah, sign yeah but there's a lot of stuff not in the book obviously yeah, so. yeah sure um, I was interested in your top fives, and um, that was Luke's idea. Top yeah, fives. Was, I, I, I was dead against the idea. <laughs> sort of ranking, <laughs> rankings. Yeah. yeah, I know. But in, in this listicle world, people love top fives. So I'm gonna, if I may, put you through the agony of. Um, no, re- I can't remember. Re- well, I can because I've got a, the book with me. So, um, okay. your top five producers. Um, your top. Number one is Daniel Lanois. That's correct. And can you give me, like, off the top of your head thoughts as to why, what do you admire most about Daniel Lanois' work? Number one, he's a great guy. Number two, he's a great communicator. Number three, he's an honest musician. Mm-hmm. You know, like, I don't know if you've heard of Arcady, his first solo album. Yeah, they're superb albums, aren't they? It's that's probably one of my favourite albums of all time, and it's an album that I carried with me whenever I worked overseas for years and years and years, just to play and listen to and and, and um, you know be inspired by. Um, and, and his attitude is really good, you know, and, and his atti- attitude is the old boy scout attitude of be prepared and, and to be ready to go at any time. And uh, I was lucky enough; I used to work a lot. At it, uh, in her studio in Fox, owned by Peter Gabriel, called Real World. Of course. And uh, I remember I was sitting down in the main room one day recording some band from uh, the. No, it's an English band. Had a very interesting lineup, and um, and all of a sudden the studio. I don't know if you've seen the, the picture of the main yeah. studio. Yes, I have. Yeah. And uh, there's a, it, it, Daniel walks just popped his head in the door and says, excuse me, I'm Daniel Lanoir. I'm working up in Peter's room up at the top of the building. Uh, I just want to let you know, if you, guys, if you ever feel like coming up and having a play or doing something, push a fader, just jam, do whatever you like, please come up because I'm working on my second solo album. I need to shine at the one of the two. And... Um, and uh, and so yeah, he was really cool. And so we'd go up there and you'd just jam and do stuff like that, and had a legendary Christmas party with him and Peter Gabriel and the Neville Brothers at um, at, in a, in a where we hired a club in in, in Bath in England, which is just nuts, you know. Like it was just a private party for all, 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 all the real world staff, and we're all just jamming on stage. And you look around, shit, I'm playing with Daniel Lemire. Oh shit, Peter Gabriel C. <laughs> and no one in the world knows, you know, which is really cool. So I can remember getting, when we got off stage, I just lined up about, I don't know, must have been 
15 or 20 tequila shots and said, here we go, boys, let's go. Big night. And crashed the car on the way home. And then we continued on in the studio back when we got back for the early hours in the morning. A lot of fun. Yeah, that's brilliant. I love, I love a story where you can just drop the fact you crashed your car on the way home and then skip past that like that's oh, just yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, well, it's luckily because i crashed it well, it wasn't me crashing my engineer niven garland because he said oh you promised me a drive and he was pissed as i was and i said sure and we we're only five yards from the front gate which is all stone and he, he jumped in the car floored it and it bang straight into this stone gate <laughs> you know the stone fence post massive thing <laughs> Yeah, so we had to leave. Yeah, so we didn't. We weren't hurt, so we just sure. got out and continued on. <laughs> Walked to the rest of the way. Yeah. Um, number two, Rick Rubin. Rick Rubin again. You know, it's what Rick Rubin doesn't say that makes him great. You know, he, he's um, listen to Rick Rubin's staff. He goes through from Def Jam right through to Tom Petty and, and, and things like that. So there's no identifiable style with Rick Rubin. And I really like that, that, which means that he's getting the best out of his out of his out of his players, and and, and so he, he's. I never met him, but he's obviously got a brilliant mind. But I've always admired the you know with the Chili Peppers right through to all those different styles that he can manage to 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 work with different styles. And so and that's one thing that you know that, that I like to think that I can do. I can work with a you know, a rock band to a symphony orchestra, and, and that's the, the result. And he even at one point um, went through a little phase of. Um, well, sorry, viewers. <laughs> there you go. Sorry. No worries. Yeah, I was just uh, saying that at, at one point Rick Rubin um, even started mixing in mono. Um, do you remember yeah. that? Um, and yeah, yeah, yeah. We used to mix in mono all the time with Van Ryn Young. Sure. It, 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 we'd have a, a, a small orotone speaker. We'd be mixing in stereo, but we'd only have one speaker. Yep, right. And so till we, till we, you know, till the, till the balance sounded great. Yeah, but yeah, you yeah, know, I can understand him doing that. But you wouldn't have released it in mono. It's just uh, you're just checking for um, how right. it sounds like on AM radio. That's uh, correct. Yeah. Um, uh, number three, Mutt Lang. Well, Mutt Lang again. You know, like the guy's uh, superb. You know, when you consider what he 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 come from South Africa, worked his way through in in, in uh, up to England and. and um, and just the stuff that he was working with. I mean, when you consider the, 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 the I mean, it's not my kind. A, a, a good record, that Def Leppard record, but it. Um, oh yes, yep. Hysteria. Hysteria. Yeah. Yeah, it's almost. It, it's a perfect, perfect, perfect recording of, of, of layering music. Mm. I mean, band I know really didn't like. The process because it, he he was just after perfection in every little tiny thing and do it again, do it again, do it again, do that bit again, do that bit again, and a lot of editing and and to, and to get it right down and a ton of compression, just mm. a ton of compression, and and so and but it's still you know huge selling record. Then he goes to you know ACDC with the with with, with uh, Back in Black and Black and uh, Highway to Hell and stuff and so. Which was different again, and then he goes to Shania Twain, which is different again. You know, like so again, he he he's able to achieve results without using a single formula, and obviously he's growing all the time. So yeah, he he's definitely he's up there. Mm. Um, number four is going back in time with Phil Spector. Well, Phil Spector was probably the guy that inspired me most to be a producer in the first place. You know, originally it was either film director or producer, but the um, uh, but the, but his sounds, you know, like with, with Ike and Tina Turner, River Deep Mountain High, oh, you name it, you know, Shirelles. Um, uh, there's so many Phil Spector songs mm. that have that wall of sound of going on, and and that's one thing I, I I sort of was doing a fair bit at one stage. I started to you know 
use a lot of different reverbs. If you've ever listened to Take Me Back by Noise Works, you <laughs> mind you, mostly on the drums and stuff. But, um, but, and so I, I, it's one thing where I have to actually have to pull myself back on sometimes is, is on the reverbs and stuff like that. But, but I, I blame it on Phil. And, <laughs> and, and, but he really, he was, you know, I guess what you'd call the first real record producer who made records. In other words, like a movie got handed a script, got handed the song and turned it into a record. Not turned it into a song, you know, turned it into this thing. Sure. Like a movie director turns a script into a picture. Sure. You know, that's what he was able to do, I really. Mm. So, a big hero. Yeah. Uh, your number five is Vander and Young, which we, of course, have already covered. Um, mm. Yeah. Well, that's pretty obvious. Yeah, it is pretty obvious. Um, just as far as production goes, um, in your book, um, Michael Gadinsky is quoted as saying, uh, there weren't many great rock producers in Australia. In fact, I think Australian music suffered for many years because there was a shortage of real producers. Do you, what's your he, take on he, what he means there? Uh, well, he's obviously considering me a shit producer. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know the end of the quiet, I can't remember it. But Michael is a very good friend of me, of mine. Uh, he and Sue have been great. His wife Sue have been great benefactors, as as the whole family has. Matt and Kate, the kids, you know, uh, their partners, Mackie and and, um, uh, and Cara. Uh, you know, they're, they're they're family friends. You know, and so they go back a long way. Mm. So with Michael, I consider him. You know, as I said before, there's, you know. There's not many people who are, who can outside of actual recording and playing who can call icons, but Ted Albert and Gidinski are definitely a couple. Typical example with Michael would be, you know, a lot of people would say, "Oh, he's a rip-off musician. He's doing this. He's doing that." And any time anyone says that to me, I stand up and say, "You just don't realise, you know." You know, you got someone like Dennis Hamlin who's pulling down probably two million dollars a year out of the US as a wage. I'm saying, Michael Gidinski takes $2 million and puts it into his company. He doesn't take away. That's what he, he invests in his own company. Mm. And that's the difference. So he's been a, a, a loyal person to the industry. The industry owes him a heap. And, um, and he's certainly, you know, through good times, bad times, he's, he's kept the industry going in so many different ways. Mm. Mm. So yeah. he's, he's big hero. So, you know, as far as his quote about rock producers I, I i'm not really sure you know you know because I'm, I'm not reading the book in front of me but no i i assume that he was saying that it, he's given me a compliment there mm -hmm. i hope so anyway sure um when you look back through uh the studios you've worked in um in fact there might well be a top five studio list here which i've missed out on but is there um what are the top two or three studios you have either kind of helped set up or work on or worked in um that stand out to you um and oh, look, why? Uh, mm. i've worked in hundreds of studios you know and and, and it's and it's you know, uh, you know obviously ryan officer which is, which is normally helped built back in you know back in the 80s which was pretty kind of stage top studio because we invested in ssl recording equipment before anyone else did and things like that so that 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 was a landmark but then again working in the electric lab studios in new york too, you know Jimmy Hendrix, you know working on the focus right consoles that Rupert Mead built there you know working at black box in, in um noyant look rabier in the wild valley which is a very it's an old farmhouse but it's got the most ridiculous set of microphones you've ever seen and the best backline equipment I've ever seen. Guy that runs it is a, 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 a an acoustician and an electrical engineer. You know, uh, you know, who's got degrees in both. And uh, but it's just insane studio. It's old and it's 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 big and it's it's, it's got the oldest console in the world. You know, that's just an old thing built for RCA Studios. What's it called? A um, Oh, I can't remember the name of it, but a big old valve thing. Mm. 
and uh, but great studio, you know, A and M studios in in Los Angeles, great studios to work in. The technical staff there is amazing. The equipment they have there is always kept up to spec. I love the fact that A and M in LA, you know, I'd be I'd be sitting there mixing in excess with Bob Clemout and and Bob would say to me, hey, let's let's see how this mix sounds in the car park. And I'd be going, what are you talking about? And, 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 and we go out in the car park and there's an old 57 Chevy sitting there that belonged to Shelly Yappers. And we jump in and, it's, and he turns the radio, I think it's to 93.5 on FM. And in, in the workshop upstairs at AM, they've got a limited band FM transmitter. So they play the mix and we tune it in on the car radio in the car park and listen to the mix in the car radio. <laughs> Uh, it's always a buzz for me any time I'm dri- driving past, you know, La Brea Avenue in LA, past the, it's now Charlie, it was Charlie Chaplin Studios, now it's Henson Recorders after A&M, mm-hmm. you know, have the radio tuned just to see if there's any mixes being played. This is <laughs> hot <laughs> tip. <laughs> yeah, yeah, hot tip. But the, um, uh, that, that's a great studio. Sam, you know, Trevor Horn Studio in London, I used to love working there, did a few projects there. Real world, you know, what a place, you know, uh, um, and uh, just uh, and what an atmosphere to work in. Mm. Uh, uh, d- 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 just great, you know. Albert's Studio One, you know, um, was fantastic. The original 301, as well as the, the newest, well, the, the, not the newest 301, but the number four, because I haven't worked in the newest 301. Sure. Was always sure. was always good to work in. Uh, 30 mil, where I work now in, in Melbourne, which is a studio, pretty much. Uh, that Colin Wimsey owner, but it's pretty much designed around my needs and the way and, and his needs as well, of course, mm. and, and and how we work together. Mm. Um, mm. So many, you know, I could rattle off ones in Turkey. I could, as you know, Gideon Tell in Paris. I love working in. Mm. You know, townhouse was okay, but a bit too commercial for me in London in those days. Mm. Um, uh, but it, it just just tons of studios. Mm. So just to um, reflect on the choices you made and and uh, what you've chosen with the studio in Melbourne, um, it's I guess interesting to reflect on how it's set up and you know how it suits your needs best. As um, you know, what were the key things that you really needed for that to work for you? Well, I need the the, the space to be friendly. And so it's 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 in it's it's built into an old like thirties bungalow, and you can't tell from outside the studio. It looks like a house, you know, on Brunswick Road. And um, but when you go in there, obviously in, the, in one of the bedrooms, they've got the needs set up. It's all acoustically treated, plus great outboard gear. You know, that, 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 that we've spent a lot of time selecting and, and getting you know stuff from Manly to Uri to. LA2As, distresses, you know, you know, all that, but the top end stuff. Mm-hmm. Having that particular need, having a, a pretty good audio control, uh, controllers as well, different types we've had over the years. Latest versions of Pro Tools, the the latest version of the of Mac computers. You know, uh, we've got a you know, dining room, we've got the grand piano set up, and in the main uh, living room is where the bands record, and we've got a Nice drum sort of set up there, which is open, but you know, foam back wall against it. We built a vocal booth in there, which the vocalist loves singing, and even when there's not a band playing, um, they 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 still um, they still uh, they love it. You know, um, going back and doing the vocals in there because they get really hot and, and things like that. But it's and it's got a kitchen in the backyard. And, and the other great thing is we've got five or six mattresses strewn around the place that, you know, in different parts. Of it. So if bands are staying there, they can just throw a mattress on the floor, fresh linen, good bathroom, good kitchen, mm-hmm. and just and, and adapt to it. We had plenty of chances to move to more flasher, more intimidating studios to the players, but we like, you know, uh, you know comfort, the, the act feeling comfortable is the most important thing. Mm-hmm. And then the equipment a second, then you know, obviously go from there. Mm. So in um, recent years, I'm not sure how long ago, but um, 
ANU, the Australian National University, um, they approached you. Um, do you want to tell us that story? Yeah, I, I got approached uh, by uh, Professor Sam Bennett in the, uh, at a, uh, Australian National University School of Music to uh, be a visiting fellow and to, to pass on my uh, uh, thoughts about, um, um, you know, music in general, the curriculum, and lecturing uh, on, on uh, music and production, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And so, you know, I just could not believe it that I've been after being a visiting fellow at such an august number one university in the country. So I, I gripped it with open arms and, uh, and, and set about their work, you know, I'd go down about five times a year, do lectures, lots of tutorials, uh, research projects, and, you know, um, and just do as much as I could to help the student cohort, you know, achieve what they want to be. And you've got to remember the student cohort, they're not rock players, they can be players to, you know, violin, to didgeridoo players, to guitar players, everything. So you had a really good mix, but the common bind, in fact, was the music. And then, and then in, um, I remember having a, a dinner with a professor in the head of school of music at the time, as the head of, head of school at the time, Ken Lamp. And they they dropped it on me that they were conferring going to uh, confer me to the vice chancellor to become the HC Coombs Creative Arts Fellow for 2018. Now Nugget Coombs, very famous Australian, was a vice chancellor of the university. He was a great treasurer. Was a great politician. Had the indigenous people at heart. Uh, did a lot for that, but. Um, and so that this cultural award is named after him, and it's it's given to artists, sculptors, musicians, etc., etc., etc. And so to have that dropped on me to be, you know, linked with people like, you know, um, Arthur Boyd, uh, there's so many famous painters, Don Burroughs, jazz, obviously. Uh, Judith Wright, poet, you know, and to be in that league. Mm. Was somewhat akin to me receiving the Nobel Peace Prize, you know, like, and I just could not believe it, you know. And it's it's the greatest honour I've ever had in my life. Yeah, fantastic. I mean, I, I've had many uh, honours bestowed on me musically, but um, you know, in the music business. But to be have one like that from the academic world, I mean, that really validates my own thoughts, you know. And you know, you know, I mean. Through the music world, you can bluff your way through for a long, long time, but you can't bluff your way through academia, in no way. And um, and so the, the fact that they, they saw fit to do that is uh, I'll be forever grateful for. And to this day, I continue to be a visiting fellow as well because it, it, it only goes for a year and comes around once every three years. But it's 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 um, it was an amazing thing to have. To be. Mm, fantastic. But, yeah. yeah, richly deserved. Hey, Mark, thanks for uh, stopping by the ISO booth. It's been a real pleasure um, being able to chat with you. Um, I uh, wish you and your family all the best and um, uh, yeah, surviving the craziness of the uh, the period that we're in. Um, well, it's just another period, isn't it? I'm, I'm very lucky, you know, like um, in the sense that uh, I, I, I'm, I live up um, at the moment on Hope Island in Queensland. It's all nice, you know. We we don't have a lot of fuss like happening in Sydney and Melbourne and things like that. It's I've got a beautiful view, plenty of food in the fridge, and uh, it's it's you know it's just to ride out. It's quite boring, you know, having to go through it all. But it's a lot more boring for other people who are suffering from it and, and the ill effects from it. Sure. But it, it's something that you know. Obviously, I think that we'll get through. Mm. But. Um, Look, you know, it's but um, but thanks for that, mm. and uh, it's uh, Chris. It's been an absolute pleasure to um, to be in the uh, the ISO booth here <laughs> with Capri behind me, and um, and um, as my constant memory. Uh, so um, yeah. see you next time. You will indeed. Thanks, Chris. <laughs>